Thanks. It's an honor to be here and kick things off and have this opportunity to chat with you all a bit about uh, CRISPR. Uh, and what I'm most excited to chat about today is definitely this concept of how do we move from treatments for disease uh, to cures for disease. We've given up on prevention, but moving from treatments to, to cures. And in particular, how do we do this for genetic diseases? Because these are diseases where there's a clear uh, cause from an alteration to the code of life, or our DNA, uh, that is the base pathology of the disease. So there ranges uh, many different types of genetic diseases from the extremely rare, like sickle cell disease, uh, to the extremely, fa extremely famous, like familial Alzheimer's disease, um, to the extremely common, like cancer, right, caused by changes to our genetic code. And if we kind of look at the data, we continuously discover more and more genetic diseases as we uncover uh, more and more of the secrets of the human genome. And if we look back to 2000, when the human genome was first sequenced, like we were talking about, we actually thought we were going to figure everything out there. But you can see we've learned a bit over the decades since then. And I would guess this chart's going to keep going up and to the right if I had to make a prediction. Um, so there's a ton, ton, ton of uh, genetic diseases. And what's uh, really interesting here is that because these are caused by alterations to the code of life, to DNA, then if we had a technology that could actually change that uh, code of life, that DNA as well, then we could actually reverse these alterations. We could actually directly cure the diseases. Um, and this is fundamentally what I think makes CRISPR so exciting, is that often, like when I was taught biology in high school, I was taught biology as this kind of messy, intractable, like hard to predict science, and it kind of is, if I'm being honest. But what's really cool and what gives me a lot of hope for the future is that technologies like CRISPR and many others uh, that are emerging over the last 10 and even five years are really allowing us to think about biology as this kind of engineering discipline, very similar to how we think about computers and software engineering. So if we think about our DNA, our genome, as a giant Word document, it's a really big one, so it has like three billion letters in it, um, then you can think of CRISPR as a way of doing a couple kind of common operations you might do on that Word document. One being control F, just finding any location. You can imagine that's a pretty hard thing to do, is just find any location in this giant document so you can do something. And another one would be something like control X, so like cut, like actually make a change there. Maybe uh, spell correct like a word or insert a paragraph. There's all sorts of, you can really abuse this metaphor, but there's all sorts of modifications that you might want to make to that uh, document that contains your DNA. So before diving into how we're actually going to use it, I think it's actually pretty informative to take a step back and ask the question of where did CRISPR actually come from? And like a lot of things in uh, biology, it comes from nature. So bacteria, very similar to us, have an immune system. And that immune system uh, wants to protect it, in particular, from things like viruses and just any other kind of exogenous genetic material that might try and co-opt the bacteria uh, to make more of itself, viruses being the obvious one. And what bacteria did is that they actually evolved this uh, technology that we call CRISPR, or more specifically Cas systems, uh, that is this kind of sentinel within the bacteria. And it kind of constantly monitors for any sign of viral uh, RNA and, or DNA. And it basically then, if it recognizes it, chops it up. And that chopping it up, that kind of scissors, is what we can co-opt to actually make cuts in uh, DNA that we want to make and actually build therapies. And if we kind of zoom in on what's happening when uh, these Cas proteins, these CRISPR systems, are actually binding to uh, DNA or RNA, and they're making these cuts, if you remember your high school biology, it all goes back to this base pairing. So A to T, C to G. So if you want to target a CRISPR system to a certain location in the genome, you design this thing that's called a guide RNA. And that's what's on top on the left here. And that guide RNA is going to be complementary. So it's going to have an A where you want to match a T. It's going to have a C where you might want to match a G to whatever sequence you're trying to detect. And then in nature, these are uh, sequences that are found in viruses. So the bacteria wants to chop it up. But when we use it as a kind of synthetic biology technology, uh, we design these guides to be specific to, say, some sort of disease gene that we want to knock out or that we want to modify in some way. Uh, and over here on the right, you can see what that looks like uh, in more detail where when it finds its complement, so when it matches all the C's to all the G's, all the A's to all the T's, et cetera, then it'll bind there. And then it has these kind of tiny molecular scissors that actually physically come together and actually cleave the DNA. Uh, and that cleavage process can be used in a variety of ways. One way is you can just 
uh, let it be cleaved, and then the kind of messy repair of that, often you'll knock out the gene. But you can also think about more kind of creative things, like what if you could actually insert a new sequence, or what if you could uh, not cleave anything at all and just kind of leave some sort of epigenetic marker upstream of it. There's a lot of really exciting things you can do once you have this technology that allows you to send a protein anywhere in the genome very reliably. And this is part of just a broader kind of revolution in the biotech space, which is what we call platform technologies. Because a really important element of CRISPR, compared to anything that came before it, is that programmability. So that idea that you can switch that guide RNA, so that top part on the left here, and you can switch from disease A to disease B without having to re-engineer the whole system. And that's been a big part of kind of the CRISPR revolution and why this technology has ca caught fire in so many different areas so quickly is because of that uh, kind of limitless reprogrammability and that reliability when you do that. So this is a great system. So like, you know, why, why, what are the limitations? <laughs> like, why are we not just curing every genetic disease? Well, it is a really great system. And we actually have already cured some genetic diseases. Um, but it has a lot of limitations. And one of the biggest ones is a barrier to doing what we call in vivo therapies. These are therapies in the body. But there's other ones as well. You might have heard about this idea of off-target effects. So this is where the CRISPR system is maybe going places you don't want it to go, because it's not perfect. Or things like the type of edit. So instead of just cutting it so you can get, get rid of the gene, what if you did want to insert a paragraph or other things? These are more complex techniques that you have to build on top of it. Uh, and then there are limitations to where it can target. So like, what if you could actually target any location in the human genome rather than just targeting a certain subset? These are all areas where you could make really big improvements to this initial CRISPR technologies. And I think the area that's most exciting to me and uh, to Mammoth as well is that idea of moving from ex vivo therapies to in vivo. And what this means is when we say ex vivo, this is where the editing is going on outside of the body. So you, so you can only do this for certain diseases. So a really uh, good example would be a kind of blood-based disorder, uh, like sickle cell disease, for example. So this is something where you can take the cells out of the body, you can make whatever edits you want, and then you can put them back in. Um, and it's a lot easier, as it turns out, and you might guess, to make edits outside of the body than it is to do them inside the body. Um, but if we think about genetic disease, like where is it located? I mean, in the brain, in the heart, in the liver, in the lung. Uh, it's really difficult to rip those out, edit them, and put them back in. Probably wouldn't be great for the patient. So we need a way of doing what we call in vivo editing, which is where you would get a single injection. It would guide the CRISPR technology to the right cells, in the brain, muscle, wherever. It would perform the edit, and then it would go away safely. So this would be a revolution in terms of actually tackling the vast majority of genetic disease. But I do want to uh, give credit uh, to the space so far that actually, well, CRISPR is a very sci-fi technology, but it's not sci-fi in the sense that there's actually now an approved therapy uh, for sickle cell disease that's based on an ex vivo CRISPR technique. Uh, it was approved at the end of last year in the United States. Actually, I believe approved in the UK uh, briefly before that as well. So this is a really exciting um, kind of next step for the technology that's already started to prove itself in a very short period of time. Um, CRISPR. Uh, the first papers came out of our co-founder Jennifer Dalton's lab a little over 10 years ago, and now it's already having approved therapies, which for people in the tech space maybe sounds like a long time. But in biotech, that's an extremely rapid advance from something that was a new invention all the way through to an approved therapy. So um, at Mammoth, we uh, have a lot of people who are intimately familiar with this space, including uh, Jennifer, who's one of the co-founders of the company, won the Nobel Prize for her work inventing CRISPR a few years ago. Uh, and then many others from her lab, like Janice and Lucas, and then uh, a team of 150 individuals that uh, have really been pushing the space forward as well. And what we looked at is like, okay, so CRISPR is this amazing platform, but it, Cas9, the first kind of iteration of the te technology, has real limitations. But as we saw, this is a technology that comes from nature. So we said, well, maybe nature has invented different flavors of this. So what we can do is we can look at um, giant databases of what we call metagenomic data. So this is data of just sequencing from all sorts of microbes, whether that's from uh, volcanoes, from soil, from the chair on the stage. Anywhere that has microbes is going to have uh, bacteria or other organisms that have versions of CRISPR. And we can sort through all of that and we can say, well, there's certain properties we're looking for. Maybe we're looking for the size of the protein. We're looking for the reliability of the edit. We're looking for uh, the locations in the genome it can target. And we can, through applying machine learning techniques, 
uh, and a huge amount of just high throughput experimentation. We have a bunch of robots at our lab that it just can run really high throughput uh, experiments. Uh, we can then pull out novel versions of these CRISPR technologies and do a ton of engineering to get them to actually work in you know, human cells. And these new nucleases, things like Cas14, Casv, NanoCas, these are all different flavors of CRISPR that have uh, various uh, properties that can give an advantage over Cas9, which was the original one. Um, so we've been working on this for, uh, well, including my co-founder's work, over 10 years now. How do we address those limitations that I was talking about earlier? Things like the location in the genome you can target, the type of edit that you're doing, um, how much you can multiplex, like can you do multiple edits in a cell? And one of the areas that we really focused in on, because it's one of the biggest limitations to actually bringing this technology into our bodies and doing this type of in vivo editing, was the size. Um, and if we look at existing kind of CRISPR uh, technologies like Cas9 and Friends, uh, these are actually quite large proteins as these things go. Now, of course, you, know, you wouldn't be able to see them in your hand, but they're you know, 1,500 to 1,000 amino acids. Um, and this presents a big problem because a lot of the ways that we deliver these types of payloads into cells have very strict size limits, and we'll see that in a second. So one of the fundamental innovations we've been able to do is we've been able to find really, really tiny versions of these CRISPR technologies that uh, just weren't possible previously. So these are things like Cas14 or Casv that can be a third or less the size of the original proteins. And you can think of this as kind of like trying to navigate around a city like London, and you either have a giant semi-trailer that can barely go around the corners, or you have a little smart car that can just easily get around to different areas. And uh, what we've really been focused on here is then how do we use this with kind of very well-validated delivery technologies, things like LNP and AV, where especially AV is one of the main methods uh, we have to go uh, to tissues in the body that are not the liver. LNP's pretty good at the liver. You might be familiar with LNP from obviously uh, the pandemic and the vaccines. Um, this can also be used to deliver gene editing technologies, um, but it has its limitations in terms of which tissues it can go to, mostly going to the liver. So if we wanna go beyond the liver, AV is really the game in town. And here, there's very strict size limit. And actually the original Cas9s, the original CRISPR technologies don't fit at all. Um, but these new smaller versions of CRISPR fit with a ton of room to spare. Um, and when you have that ton of room to spare, you can think very creatively about how to use it. Um, and one of the ways that we're using it is to also build in these kind of new types of edits. So we talked about how you can do double strand breaks to do like just knock out a gene. That's just using the cutting part of this uh, protein. But there's other things you can do as well. You could insert a paragraph. And that would be what we call gene writing. And that's additional machinery that you need to put into the AV. Or you could do epigenetic editing. So that's kind of, instead of uh, knocking a gene out, what if you could turn a volume knob on the gene, kind of make it louder or softer, depending on what you need. Uh, or base editing. So just change a single letter in that entire document of your genome. These are all techniques that require you not just to deliver the CRISPR protein, but to deliver other machinery as well. Um, so this has been a huge unlock in terms of how do you actually do any type of edit uh, anywhere in the genome. So I think the mammoth opportunity here and what I hope you take away from this is that we really are on the cusp of being able to do any edit in any cell, which is an incredible innovation for a field that I think we are taught is super messy. And honestly, it is really messy. And I think what this is gonna unlock is the ability to uh, potentially permanently cure genetic diseases. And there's you know, 6,000 of them plus that we already know but what I think is even more exciting is that there's many diseases that we don't even understand well yet. And we're rapidly reaching the point where I truly believe we're gonna be better at editing the genome and changing the code of life than we are even understanding what to change. So the next wave of innovation will have to be further innovating on how do we actually understand the genetic basis of disease itself. Um, so looking forward to the panel and uh, really excited to kick things off everyone.